Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. A lot of the commentaries that I've looked at in the last uh, few weeks about this, um, they go into great detail in attempting to explain the terrain. But living in western Colorado as we do, we don't need a lesson on this, do we? We live in a, canyon, or in, a, in a land of canyons and valleys, and so we can pretty easily imagine the scene here. Um, close quarters are actually being described. This would have been a very narrow valley. Some people might almost look at it as a canyon. Um, it maybe was a couple of miles wide, probably though it was less than that. Probably it was about a mile wide. And um, the thing that you would find is that there was a stream that went through it, a little stream bed. And the two armies, if you can imagine this, are assembled, again, probably a mile apart. Um, one on one side and, and the other army on the other one. And if you think about that, and if you understand um, the, exa- or the, 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 the superiority that the Philistines had, then you would understand that this was not a comfortable arrangement to begin with for Israel's overmatched army, right? Probably something that they were experiencing some intimidation. But I want you to see here in the text that things were even more unsettling. And so go ahead and look back at uh, the chapter there. Look at verse 4. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines. Now this was not an uncommon Eastern custom. Uh, I think that you can understand pretty well what's going on. Sometimes what would happen is if uh, two armies were assembled against one another, there would be an agreement and each would send out a champion. And they would fight one-on-one, so to say, um, with the understanding that, that the victor basically would take the day. That's what's going on here. This champion, look at this though, that came out from the armies of the Philistines, was named Goliath, and he was from a place called Gath. And now look at this, his height was six cubits and a span. We don't measure things in cubits, and so we may be a little thrown by that, but the best that we can tell, uh, that would have made Goliath about nine and a half feet tall. Um, scripture is clear, by the way, that a now extinct race of giants lived in the region, including, by the way, this Philistine city of Gath. I want to be really clear with you here that that I take that to be literal. I take that to be accurate. Um, Some of the Bible um, interpreters and commentators try to get around that. They say that maybe something was transposed there. I found one in particular that said Goliath was not nine feet six. He was six foot nine and there was a swap. Uh, Listen, reject that stuff as the foolishness that it is. The Bible is very specific. And in fact, as we look At the description of his armor, we're going to see that it would have taken a guy that was nine feet six to pack it around. Go and look at verse five. This Goliath had a bronze helmet on his head. He was clothed with scale armor. Uh, This is interesting. The Philistines had something like a, a canvas sort of garment that would be covered with ringed bronze. This uh, scale armor look, which weighed five thousand shekels. Now, depending on the, how much you consider a shekel to be, we would say that Goliath is wearing there maybe 125 to 150 pounds of armor. Uh, that's a lot, and it's not all. Look at the next verse, 6. He also had bronze greaves on his legs, and so he has bronze greaves covering the lower part of his body. And look at this. He had a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders, and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. The head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's about 15 pounds probably by that same standard. And look at this. Here's part of this that we usually overlook. Look at the end of verse 7. His shield carrier also walked before him. Uh, Now, if you missed all of that stuff about Goliath, don't miss that last part because that's an extra man just to carry the shield since apparently with all of the other stuff, Goliath couldn't handle it on his own. And so, by the way, what that really is is kind of a two-for-one deal. Uh, You're not just going to get Goliath, you're going to get his shield bearer, the uh, human shield in this particular case. Not exactly fair terms. Verse 8 though, uh, Goliath would stand, it says, and he shouted to the ranks of Israel. Can you imagine the voice that a man of that size, how we would have it and the way that it would carry in a canyon like that? Probably reverberated and echoed and bounced all over the place. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Now look at this. Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? There's a lot to that. Um, Goliath, I think that we see here, wasn't unfamiliar with Israel's political situation. If you're with us several weeks ago, when we look briefly at chapter 8, you might remember that 
what uh, this stuff of Israel having a king was all about was about their rejection of God as their king, remember? And so uh, God allowed them to have a king. But remember there in chapter 8, God told Samuel to warn the people that their human king would make them his own servants. And remember that uh, the Philistines and Israel, they are in close quarters. And so what you should see here is that Goliath knew all about that. Word had gotten out, it had traveled. Israel had essentially rejected their God as being king for Saul. And that's what Saul is, or that's what Goliath is saying here. Am I not the mighty Philistine and you just the servants of Saul? Keep reading, look what he says. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. He's describing this, this match that he has in mind. Verse 9, if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. That's the picture at Sukkah of the army of Israel and of the spiritually cowardly Saul. If you look at this, the thing that you understand is that uh, really humiliating defeat is just a matter of time. And amazingly, the narrative changes just for a short time, a short burst. The narrative changes away from Saul and it changes in the direction of Israel's God-chosen king. Uh, maybe you remember him. Remembered God's chosen king for Israel? Outwardly remember, he's not incredibly impressive. At least ways, he's not incredibly impressive outwardly as kings go. He's young. Probably in his teens. That, by the way, is why he's not there with the rest of the fighting men. He's apparently not old enough to be of military service. He's young. I think he's apparently ordinary in stature. Uh, this is a text that gives, in fact, all of for Samuel really does it. It deals with Goliath. It deals with Saul. And it speaks of their stature. There's really no mention made of David's stature. And so, apparently, he's ordinary when it comes to size. He's ruddy. Talked about that, maybe pale, maybe lightly complected. And even he's not an incredibly impressive guy, at least ways from the outside. And, and we find him in the text out in the countryside near Bethlehem, tending the family's sheep. Doesn't even have an impressive job. Meanwhile, back in the Valley of Elah, though, the bullying continues, the intimidation continues. Now I want you to look back there. We've seen David. Now look at 16. It says, the Philistine came forward. Now look at this, morning and evening. Do you see that? For 40 days and took his stand. Do you get the picture? Uh, not once a day for 40 days. Twice a day for 40 days. Um, there's the Philistine. There's the giant. There's Goliath doing that very same thing, standing there, defying, taunting the armies of Israel, taunting Saul, taunting God. And he does that day after day after day. You get the feeling that things are bleak and becoming bleaker all of the time. And it's then, according to verse 17, that Jesse says to David, his son, really in God's perfect timing, look at this. Jesse said to David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand." Just quickly here, the thing that's going on that you should understand is that this was a common way of supporting an army in ancient times. Uh, you know, you would not only have the responsibility maybe of sending your sons out to fight, but you would have the responsibility of provisioning them. That's the thing that's uh, going on on the surface. But I think that there's something here that Jesse is even more interested in. And if you look at this, it's pretty plain here. The thing that Jesse is really interested in is whether his three oldest sons are well, or probably what he really wants to know is if they're even alive. Keep reading here. He tells David, look at this, to look into the welfare of your brothers. See, are they okay? Have they been injured? And look at this, and bring back news of them. Uh, bring back some proof, basically, that they're alive, is what he's saying. And so off David goes. Maybe a 15-mile walk to the Valley of Elah. In this case, it was a 15-mile run. David arrives. 
Look at about the middle of verse 20 here in chapter 17. David came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array shouting the war cry. That's the way that he found Israel there. 21 says, Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array army against army. Now we know that for Israel, as it has been for well over a month now, this is going to be nothing more than a show. A very brief show at that. They're posturing here, uh, maybe vainly hoping that, that Goliath has become bored and left or fell sick or something. Not a chance. Look at verse 22. David is going to get in the middle of it. David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper. And he ran to the battle line and entered in, and entered in order to greet his brothers. And look at 23. And as he was talking with them, that is, talking with his brothers, behold, the champion. The Philistine from Gath named Goliath was coming up from the army of the Philistines. And he spoke these same words. What does that mean? Well, it means that he shouted out the very same taunt. It was probably something like this. Hey, you cowardly servants of the cowardly King Saul. It's me, the big bad Philistine, defying you, defying your king, defying your God. Send someone out to me so that I can slaughter him and we can get this done and you can be our servants. The same thing continued to happen, right? It had happened day after day after day. And if you look at this, there's really a routine that's developed. Goliath would come out and do that and the army of Israel would tuck tail and run. Sure enough, the same thing happens. Israel's army breaks its ranks and its men flee in terror. Look at verse 24. Have to love the honesty of the Bible in places like this. When the men of Israel saw the man, and isn't that interesting? He's not described there as a giant. He's described as a man. When they saw the man, they fled from him, look, and were greatly afraid. Only this time, something was very, very different. Right? Something was different this time. You see, this time, God's chosen king who had not been there, this time, God's chosen king was there and he heard. See, look back at the end of verse 23. We skip this. Look back. Goliath spoke the same words, taunted them in the same way as before. Look at this. Best part of the whole thing. And David heard him. It's a dreadful turn of events for the giant and for the Philistine. Don't you love it when the Bible embeds in the simplest of ways these crucial, crucial messages? 